Duncan, thanks for the invitation. Um, I didn't choose the title, and I hope I understood it correctly, because it had a stray apostrophe in the title, so this one doesn't. And I'm hoping I didn't misunderstand. So, um, here we go. So, uh, the rationale from this uh, study is the... Uh, <laughs> 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 it's gone blue. Sorry. I pressed the wrong button. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, the rationale for this study. So, I, I think you're going to hear quite a lot of echoes in this talk from uh, some of the aspects that have uh, come uh, already this afternoon, which is quite good because I think we're, we're all singing from the same hymn sheet. So the rationale for our work was that uh, we know that there are various areas around Antarctica where people have shown uh, trends in, trends in, uh, in warming uh, or freshening. And the glaciologist's point of view is, well, we know all this. Uh, it's global warming. The glaciers are sitting in this warm bath. And if the bath's getting warmer, so uh, it must be leading to the ice shelves. And, I guess to us as oceanographers, we go, whoa, that's too simple. Um, we don't think it's, it's that obvious. So our rationale with what we tried to do was to use all the available climatologies uh, of temperature and salinity to try to look all the way around Antarctica uh, at long-term changes. And we look particularly at the cause of water masses. So JB talked earlier about mixed layer depth, <clears throat> but what we've tried to do is look at the temperature maximum layer or the temperature minimum layer or particular water mass core layers, which I think is a, a, an easier way of looking at uh, databases. So uh, we wanted to know if we could use those to uh, try to understand and predict uh, the impacts on the ice shelves. So this is quite a complicated figure, so uh, I'll go through it, but it kind of echoes what we've heard already from JB, so it's just a slightly different way of looking at it. Um, but it, as JB showed, in the, in the 70s and 80s, everything was ships and pretty sparse. And in the 90s, we had WOS, and we all trotted off on ships, and we've got quite a nice network uh, from ships, but it's summer-dominated. And then in the 2000s, the Argo floats came along and uh, have reasonably good coverage uh, and in the most recent decade of the most recent years it's the seal tag data so these figures are colored by year so uh, for each decade the uh, early years in the decade are bluey colors blue and turquoise and the later years in the decade are uh, reds and yellows so for 2010 uh, the data that we had uh, was only the first few years so uh, I'm going to use those uh, data from there to see what we can tease out of them. And uh, this figure shows the, uh, the length of data sets that, are, uh, that, were, that you can have at each location. So the purple colors, you've got many years, many decades, 30 odd de uh, years. And in the uh, little orangey colors, you've only got 20 odd uh, years. And this lists all of the different climatologies that Sunka Schmitko put together to, uh, to put together all of the data we could get our hands on. Um, so the figure on the left is for the uh, open ocean water masses, really, the winter water which is the temperature minimum layer, and the circumpolar deep water, which uh, we're taking as the uh, warm water maximum. The figure on the right is the area that I'm going to focus a little bit more on, because it was the focus of our study, which is the temperature of the water at the seabed. So uh, mostly uh, around uh, the Antarctic continent. So the water on the shelf that is the, uh, on the figure on the right. And you can see that there are uh, some areas where you've got good coverage, LTER, like Anna mentioned, uh, and the Ross Sea, and other areas where there are many fewer years. So uh, these were the results for the, uh, for the temperature and the salinity of the uh, 
what we called Antarctic continental shelf bottom water, which is a bit of a mouthful. So I'll just refer to shelf water, but remember it's the water at the bottom. And the top two figures are the mean uh, temperature and the mean salinity. The bottom two figures are the trend in temperature and the trend in salinity. Where it worked, well, we've plotted it for everywhere, but everywhere where it's hatched out or where that trend is not statistically significant. So Sunka did some uh, fairly complex statistics on this to make sure that they were reasonably robust. And we heard from Matt earlier on that this is very much a big issue. And we don't have uh, good uh, estimates for large areas around Antarctica. So the two uh, areas where in this figure, if I can get this to work. Two areas uh, where you do have a reasonably statistically significant trend in temperature are around here uh, in the uh, Amazon Sea and the Bellingshausen Sea for temperature, and in the case of salinity, the, the Ross Sea. And you can see hints of, of trends elsewhere, but often they're not statistically robust. So the figure on the right-hand side uh, highlights the trend in uh, each of those uh, coloured regions. So on the left-hand side, we've got colour-coded uh, the Bellingshausen, the Amundsen, and so on. And those trends are shown in the uh, figure on the right, the temperature, conservative temperature at the top, and salinity in the bottom. And uh, here you can... You can see, A, how uh, variable the time series are, and B, uh, where they are statistically significant in increasing. So the Amundsen Sea here in the, uh, in the blue, you can see that uh, warming trend. And in salinity for the Ross Sea, you can see that uh, decreasing trend. So... Uh, these trends, well, we saw that the 50 years uh, of or few decades that we've got is uh, pretty unevenly spaced. And uh, JB showed this too, and everybody else has shown it. Uh, so if we look at those trends only from 1990, when we've got better data from the WOS and so on, uh, how different are those trends? So the top figure, or well, the bottom figure, are the ones that we just saw. And the uh, top figure uh, is the temperature trend if we only use the 1990 onwards. And you can see uh, a number of things. So the, uh, the Ross Sea uh, freshening is robust in, in both. And uh, the warming around the Amundsen Sea is robust. But for example, uh, in, the, uh, in the Weddell Sea, there was this cooling trend uh, in the previous figure but if you look at that same region from just 1990, uh, you see a completely opposite sign of that trend. So that is clearly not uh, a convincing or robust uh, long-term trend. You can do the same analysis for the different water masses. So this is for the temperature maximum layer, the, the circumpolar deep water. And here we've got the mean temperature salinity and depth of that temperature maximum. And on the bottom, the uh, long-term trends in each of those. This is from the whole data set. And the figure on the right-hand side is the trend in the depth of the CDW. And uh, you can see, in general, a warming of the CDW layer. Uh, and you can also see a shoaling. So it's becoming shallower, particularly here around the Amundsen Sea, Bellingshausen regions, but also over here. So we think that that trend is probably associated with causing some of those trends in the near Antarctic water masses in the previous figure. If you do the same for the, the temperature minimum layer, the winter water, uh, again, we've got temperature salinity and depth of the trends in the bottom and again hatched out where it's not significant. You can see that there are some regions where uh, the winter water is freshening, for example, quite significantly. Uh, and a bit of warming over here. So the summary schematics that Sunka put together, uh, so the, the top figure here 
is for the Amundsen and Bellingshausen regions, the areas where you've got relatively warm water coming onto the continental shelf. And the bottom figure for uh, the, the Ross and Weddell Seas, where you've got the strong slope current, uh, you've often got bottom water formation uh, and so on. So uh, this is what we saw with the, the CDW uh, shoaling upwards, warming, and uh, we suspect that that's associated with warmer water uh, getting onto the continental shelf and increasing that uh, melting of the ice shelves. So uh, this echoes what JB was saying. The current climatologies that we've got are dominated by summertime data. So how can we get the wintertime data? We can have under ice floats, as we've heard before, and we can also put tags on marine mammals. And um, Anna showed us uh, one of the figures, I think it was the top right-hand figure uh, from the Amundsen Sea. So this was the study that we did uh, 2014, uh, tagging uh, 14 uh, Weddell seals and elephant seals. And the uh, figure on the top left shows a 13,000 profile. So that's several times more profiles in the Amundsen Sea than uh, obtained from the entire historical data set. So uh, we need to be a bit careful for future climatologies because they will be heavily dominated in numbers by 2014. Uh, and this is colored by month. So uh, the uh, August, September, the red colors are towards the, uh, the end of winter and uh, the cooler colors are uh, just after we tag them. So uh, we now, we're now analyzing uh, these, these data sets. Um, here there's a time series of the, uh, the temperature right in front of the Pine Island Glacier. For some reason, seals really like ice shelves, which is great for us. As soon as we tag them, they all disappear off to the front of all of the ice shelves. So we have very nice time series from those ice shelves. Must be something biological, I'm guessing. So um, one of the uh, cautionary tales, I suppose, I wanted to bring to this workshop was we were really lucky in the case of our work last year in that we, before we deployed the tags on the seals, we were able to put those tags on the CTD lower it down to the seabed and get a uh, simultaneous profile from CTD and from the tag that would subsequently be put on the seal. You can't usually do that because the whole advantage with seals is that you can land somebody on a beach and go and stick the tags on them. But we have that. And that's made a huge difference to the quality of the data that we were able to get. So uh, what I asked my student to do was to pick out two, uh, two tags, a good tag and a bad tag. And so what we're seeing here on the left-hand side are profiles of, of temperature. And uh, there are two different colors here, red and blue, but you can't see the difference because they're pretty well on top of each other. So the temperature of that tag, uh, that was pretty good. If you look at the um, temp temperature salinity space, however, you can see that there's quite a big offset in salinity. So we're able to, uh, to calibrate it. So the, uh, the blue is the corrected tag data. Red is the raw tag data that you would get uh, straight from the tag. And the black is the CTD data. The, uh, the, the less good tag, you can see here, at least in temperature, it's less good. So uh, there's a pressure offset in this particular tag. So the deeper it goes, the different it, uh, the greater the difference in temperature between the CTD and the, and the tag. And this is quite an enormous difference uh, down here. We're able to correct for that because we, were, we had the simultaneous data set. Here is the rather well, manky looking uh, temperature TS space. Now that doesn't take account of uh, the fact that when you put the tag on the seal, the conductivity changes because of the effect of the seal on the tag. So, as we heard earlier, Fabian uh, is working very hard on automating all the calibration processes for the seal tags. And you're not always going to be able to be able to put the tags on, on the uh, CTDs. But where we can, 
I really think it will make a huge difference to the quality of the data that we can bequeath to our future oceanographers. So I'm a glider fanatic. I can't uh, resist throwing in one last slide, uh, which is gliders. And uh, I guess this is another way of, of getting huge quantities of data in a relatively short time. So this was the study that we did in the Weddell Sea in 2012. And uh, in uh, less than three months, we had uh, 1,600 profiles, which again, vastly exceeds all the, the historical data in that region. So gliders, I think, uh, are going to be a, one of the answers to filling in those gaps in the, uh, in the region. So my conclusions, um, I think we can be fairly confident that there's a reasonably robust trend in the temperature on the continental shelf of West Antarctica the last few decades and that that has contributed to the enhanced melting of the ice shelves, and that has probably led to the freshening in the Ross Sea that we can see again as another robust trend. And I think we can be confident that that's uh, uh, linked with this shoaling of the CDW and warming of the CDW. But as we've heard uh, from a number of speakers, these trends that we can detect really are at the limit of what we can get out. We weren't even sure we were going to get any, any believable trends when we first started looking at this, because we thought there just isn't enough data. And we, we're, we're not trying to gloss over the gaps in the data. They really are um, challenging for all of us. So I think for the future, the tags on the marine mammals are absolutely brilliant and should be a key part of SUS. But I would caution that uh, we do need to take very much uh, a lot of attention to the quality control. I think the gliders and the new sorts of uh, floats going under the ice, for example, are going to be key contributors. And uh, I'd like to think that somebody trying to do these trends in another decade or two decades will be able to be much more confident and will have a lot less hatched out areas in those maps of trends than we were able to have. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Um, does anyone have a quick question for Karen? JB? Uh, don't you think that the temperature maximum uh, depth of the seasonal cycle, and could your trend be like, affected by this seasonal cycle? I think in some regions it certainly will have a seasonal cycle. Um, it, it's relatively deep. And it's below the winter water. I think the winter water may well have a will have uh, a seasonal cycle in its depth, but we're looking well below that. So the, there may be a seasonal cycle in some areas where the fronts perhaps are moving back and forth seasonally. Do you do you have one in your data? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'll definitely look at it. <laughs> Good question. So do we have any idea about the internal variability for the temperature of the seabed? Like, uh, if we can look at the model results to get the internal variability for the temperature at the seabed, because you, you have a, you can we cannot see any warming in the around the West, East Antarctic uh, coastal region. Do you mean on the shelf or in yeah, the, the shelf in, region? Yeah, on the shelf. I, I mean, there are some areas where I think we can see interannual variability, but the, the data are so sparse. But some, there are some places where some, some moorings have been uh, maintained. I think Steve's uh, moorings in the, and in the Weddell Sea. Uh, it, if I can speak for the uh, Amundsen Sea, we recovered a five-year mooring, uh, which was Dan Jacobs, and there is very significant interannual variability mm. on the scale of a couple of years. So, okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I've got just a more general comment. So, uh, for the last three talks, we've seen Fabian's 
picture and the uh, important <laughs> work that he does. And I just wanted to mention that uh, he does, he volunteers doing that, he's not funded. And they are looking for fundings to uh, have a sustainable way to do it. I think it's very important. So I think, I think anyone using this data, it's very important to acknowledge for, for, this, for, for them to find fundings and make sure that we do have this because I definitely don't want to do it myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we are actually doing it ourselves. So I have a student working with the Sea Mammal Research Unit. So. But we're working with Fabian too. Yeah. But we're lucky that we had the, the tags on the, yeah. on the rosette. If we can do that, I think we should do that. Well, I think, I think we'll just move on yeah. to the next speaker.